Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks for uh, watching our earlier in the day Design Innovation Month webcast. Uh, my name's Chris Dubuque, located out of the Portland, Oregon office, and I'm just going to be helping out with today's webcast. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Mark Abshire, Senior Application Engineer for our Manufacturing Solutions, located in the St. Louis office. Mark, it's all yours. Thanks, Chris. So this morning, we're going to talk about stress analysis with 3D printing. Now, this will probably be one of the shorter presentations of our Design Innovation Month. But hopefully you're going to see something that's new that you've never seen before, and hopefully it will provoke some thought and innovation to your designs as you go along and think about 3D printing them, especially when you 3D print them. So when you look at finite element analysis, we're all pretty familiar with FEA out there. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, FEA began in the 1940s to analyze complex structural problems. However, it's important to note that FEA is based on mathematical algorithms, and you can only approximate a stress condition based on limited information. It cannot predict any flaws or any defects that might occur in the manufacturing process. And this is important to note because your manufacturing process, if you're machining the parts or excess stock and, and your uh, end mill is dull or if you're uh, in no cuts too deep, then it changes, it can change your stress load dramatically. So just keep in mind, it's kind of like scanning. When you scan a part with a 3D scanner and you compare it for inspection, you're comparing against a perfect condition in your CAD. Not all manufacturing processes create a perfect condition. So before we had finite ELMA analysis, just a, just a little history here, we still had a lot of engineering marvels that were created before we even had tools. The Wright Brothers 1903 flyer was the first sustained and controlled heavier than air powered flight. And it might be interesting for your trivia knowledge to note that the distance of their first flight is less than the wingspan of a modern jet. Also, if you look at other engineering models for architecture, you'll see that the Eiffel Tower was built in uh, 1889 for the World's Fair. Now, there's also other modern mo marvels here that were built, and I refer to this one. There's a lot of successful ones that we can point at out there. However, not all engineering marvels uh, benefited without F FEA tools. Some of them should have had FEA tools. I point this one out, this tragedy, just to reinforce a necess necessity of engineering of disciplines. So using your tools is always a good thing for what's available out there. So I want to talk about the history of FEA. It actually started with a photoelastic stress. In the early 19th century, David Brewster observed this light refraction phenomena in glass. And he foresaw this as a potential application for stress analysis. So it wasn't unusual for crystal prisms to separate light waves. There's nothing new about that at the time. But what was revolutionary was that the light waves could optically, optically see stress distribution. This method is called photoelastic stress, and it's the forerunner to our modern FEA tools. The advantage of photoelastic stress is really simple to use out there. It's a virtual method to determine the stress distribution of part geometry. It can be viewed in a relaxed state as well as under mechanical force. And I'll emphasize this, unlike analytical methods of stress calculations, photoelasticity gives a fair, accurate picture of stress distribution around imperfections in the actual manufactured part. This method is an important tool for identifying critical stress concentration on irregular geometries. So keep in mind, what you're looking at there is actually a clear part that you're looking at the photoelastic stress, not an FEA analysis. So just to give you an idea of how this works, this is the principle of it, how it works. The phenomenon requires light passing through a clear or transparent object 
with the refractive material on each side of the object to create a double refraction. This is known as birefringence. Also note that the linear polarized filters there that I'm showing, uh, those are linear direction. Therefore, for the best possible uh, chromatic image, those need to be perpendicular or adjacent 90 degrees to each other uh, to get your birefringence to show up the best. Now, this is the principle of it. Let me show you how it works in a practical sense. In a practical sense, most laptops have polarized screens already to, to minimize the glare. So it can be your light source for your filter, while a camera with a polarized lens can capture the chromatic image. Camera I also should mention that camera filters are typically circular polarization, and they're not linear. This will work also. I only pointed out the linear first because if you do use linear polarization, you will need to have them adjacent to get your view. But for, for circular polarization that's on your polarized lenses, on your laptop, your sunglasses, all those things will work well for you on that. So that's the practical of it. So here's the actual application of how it works. We created this 3D printed uh, part. This has got a very clear material. And if you look at this part, you'll notice, I'll point it out here with my mouse, that I've got some sharp edges and I've got some rounded edges. I've got a sharp edge up here in this corner and the other radius down here. So that when I actually put this between two polarized filters here and I put light against it, you can see the difference. You can, especially up in this area where I've got a square corner, you can see your stress here and you can see your stress around the radius is much more minimized. So this will give you a visual analysis of stress and a part. It only works with clear materials um, so that, that light will pass through and you're, reflect, you're reflecting light from both sides of a filter so it's actually reflecting back and forth. So I have one of our simulation guys, experts, uh, do a simulation of the same part for me uh, using SOLIDWORKS and he used the Von Mises yield uh, application and set it to acrylic plastic and we put 7.5 pounds of force applied. And here you can see the difference between looking at an FEA analysis, here it does show your stress, it does show your strain, but your chromatic image sometimes can show you much, much more in there when you're starting to compare uh, different stresses in there. And for the best stress uh, analysis, I want to mention that you really should make uh, your model with excess stock on it and machine it uh, with the same manufacturing process if you're going to use mills or lathes, and that will replicate most of your manufacturing errors that you can actually view. The picture that you're actually looking at is called a blisk. That is a blade and a disc for an aircraft engine that was 3D printed and captured with high speed film and a polarized filter while it was spinning. So quite a bit of application in there uh, to look at the uh, actual stress uh, and not just FEA analysis. So when people look at FEA analysis, we think of all the mathematics and the computers. This, and, and, and really, the computers we have today are really super computers compared to what we had uh, 20 years ago even. So before that, we would use uh, clear parts to look at our stress in here. And uh, it still works today with 3D printing. So with our 3D printing models, we can do real time, real world, real manufacturing analysis. And that's really all I have to show. I told you it would be a short one, but hopefully it was interesting uh, to you to see a different way to look at stress analysis. Uh, is there any questions or observations out there? Mark, I did not see any come through the chat. I must have done well then. I think we're, I think we're good to go. Okay. That was a short one, guys, but uh, uh, join us. Uh, we're doing two, two a day uh, for the rest of the month. So join us for more, and you'll get a lot more information. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mark. That uh, 
definitely got me thinking about different ways of looking at stress analysis, that's for sure. And thank you for everybody that attended. Like Mark said, we've got many of these going throughout the month. We've got our live events. So I hope to see uh, some of you attendees at our live events if you're here in the Northwest or on another one of our webcasts throughout the month. Thank you very much, everyone.